All right. Let me, let me recap for a second the notion of the entrepreneurial dynamic model in which we emphasize growth and learning and, and focusing on the future. You can summarize it, I think, pretty simply. It's not who you are today. It's who you want to be tomorrow that counts in America. And I frankly would argue that when we pick up on welfare next week and on the culture of poverty, that that's the core weakness in the way we deal with the problem today. We don't emphasize to, with people, tell us who you want to be. Don't tell us about your problems. Don't tell us about your past. Don't tell us about your weaknesses. Tell us who you want to be. And now let's figure out what strengths and skills you need to get to be that person. And let's go to work on it. It's a very different attitude. It's an attitude of opportunity focus rather than victim. Excuse me. Now, at the vision level, what we're suggesting is that a successful America will have the, the highest value-added jobs with the greatest productivity, leading to the greatest take-home pay and the greatest job security. That is, the way you get job security is not by blocking the world market, it's by winning in the world market. Let me put it a little bit differently, and, and, and I think that, that uh, Morris Schechtman's book, Working Without a Net, which I've told him I think is mistitled. I think he's really talking about creating your own net rather than relying on big systems for a net. But, but his idea is essentially right, and that is that real security is based on real productivity and real economic growth. So real security is based on real change. It, it's the security of a kayaker in a whitewater river who is paying attention and negotiating the changes. It's very different from what people think of. People, people really say, gee, can I build a castle where I can stop and rest? And the answer is no. What you can do is you can, you, can, you can think through and you can build assets and you can build resources. And obviously, if you're prudent and careful, you can build a lot of resources for your old age. But during your working years, you have to dynamically interface with a world that is changing. One of the ways to measure that is to look at how in each generation who is succeeding changes. For example, if you looked at, at uh, Henry Ford in 1905 or Alfred Sloan in 1922 or Bill Gates today, each of them in a sense was the man of the future. But the question is, who's tomorrow's man of the future? Gates is now an established figure. He's been around for 10 or 12 years. He's in a sense yesterday's great success story. Not that he's not important, not that he's not powerful, but Microsoft is now in some ways what IBM was 30 years ago. So what's the next Microsoft? And it may well be in biotechnology, frankly. But it's this concept that what you're always looking for is not some static, uh, academic, planned, structured investment. What you're looking for is the dynamic, creative, entrepreneurial energy and drive that meets the marketplace. And what you want to do, in a sense, is given this vision of winning in the world market, creating local jobs through world sales, you need to set up a series of strategies. Now, what we're trying to do now is build strategies that come out of our vision, which is, a, which is an entrepreneurial vision, so the strategies will be very different than the strategies that bureaucrats and academics would create in a welfare state vision. It's very important to understand why they're so different. Remember, I drew, I drew earlier, and I want to go back and remind you. The, the, the core theme here, and the same thing will come up next week, is that the vision is dramatically different. Up here at the top, therefore, the strategies, even if they look similar, are in fact relating to a very different vision. Therefore, the projects, even if they might be identical in form, are inside of different strategies which relate to a different vision. And so finally, what you're doing tactically, for example, presumably even in a welfare state restaurant, you would be nice when the customer walked in. Presumably. Although you might take the attitude of a government uh, run uh, cafeteria and compare it to the attitude of a restaurant where if they're not nice you don't come back. But presumably they would try to create the same tactic. Please be nice to the customer. Please wash the plates. But the whole underlying model of reward and incentive, the whole expectation, is different in the two systems. One of the strategies is to reward success at job creation and keep resources with job creators. Now this, this refers back both to the lessons of American history and to entrepreneurial free enterprise. That what you want to do is you want to reward success at job creation, you want to keep resources with job creators. It also means in terms of looking back at, at personal strength as a pillar, what you say to people is, if you don't have a job right now, have you considered creating one? 
you consider calling App Amway or Tupperware or Mary Kay or Beauty Control or any one of a hundred systems? Have you considered going out and starting your own small business? But, but don't say automatically, I can't get a job, there is no job, I'm hopeless, please let me be a victim for a while. Totally different attitudes. Second, you want to strengthen the family for an economic reason. Families create human capital. I mean, the most important bankers in development are families. Because somebody comes to you and says, I need a little bit of money to finish college, or I need a little bit of money to open up my store, or I need a little bit of money to do something. Why do we see such a rapid rise of Asian families? Because they are extended networks of capital accumulation. You can have 20 or 30 or 40 families that say, cousin, you know, Sam has got a great idea. Let's each of us kick in a little bit. And then cousin Sam does well. And now cousin Sam is part of the extended bank. It's a, it's a family bank. And so extended families and strong families are major sources of capital development. And by the way, guess where most learning takes place? Inside the family. So when you see the collapse of the family, and when you see a society which tolerates totally self-centered, destructive parents, and parents who have not got a clue why they're parenting, they haven't got a clue how to educate their child, they haven't got a clue about being responsible, and you tolerate that, and you think, well, that, that poor victim, who is, of course, now creating new victims, you are cheating yourself of a major capital resource, which is the human beings of the next generation. So when you end up with kids who don't know how to clean up after themselves, don't know how to study, don't know how to be disciplined, don't know how to be nice to anybody, don't know how to interact with other human beings, and have had nobody in their immediate family do anything to teach them, the, the burden you put on the school system is hopeless. Because most learning doesn't occur in a classroom. Most learning occurs in a family environment and in a neighborhood environment. And until we are honest about that, we're not going to solve it. Now, if you really want lots of jobs, and this is exactly counterintuitive to the welfare state. It's the exact opposite of the welfare state. If you really want lots of jobs, what you do is you cut taxes on job creation. You, want to re you really want to increase uh, the employment factor for the marginally unemployed, for black inner city kids and American Indians on a reservation and poor whites in West Virginia? cut out all the taxes. So you hire that person, you don't have to pay FICA. You don't have to pay income tax. You don't have to pay unemployment compensation. Just pay them straight. You see, the minimum wage isn't the minimum wage. The minimum wage is gross pay, and it's not real cost because you have to add all the extra taxes. Uh, Jim Longley uh, told me the other day, the congressman from, from uh, Maine, that there are nine taxes in Maine when you hire somebody. So you're paying the surface amount plus the other taxes, and the person isn't even getting the surface amount. And so if you really wanted to hire the, the hardcore unemployed, you'd say, for anybody who fits in this zone, there are no taxes if you hire them. And overnight, they become more employable. 